turn over to Acts chapter 20, and in Acts chapter uh, 20, we want to pick it up in verse 28, where we left off last Wednesday uh, night. Now, um, actually, all of this that we've been studying the last several weeks has to do with the matter of the background of the book of Ephesians. Now, now all of this is the background. Now, uh, when we get into the book of Ephesians, it'll help us to understand it in a better way and um, get more out of the book because, see, there's a lot of material in the book of Acts in relation to the founding of the church at Ephesus. Acts 19, they had the big bur uh, book burning, and then they were run out of town because the people had sold the idols in the temple of Diana. Uh, they got all uh, worked up because they were losing business because people were not buying the idols like they used to. And so it's very interesting background. And then um, here in Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul is about 30 miles away and he has a stop off uh, with his boat on his way to Jerusalem. So he calls for the people in the church there at, um, uh, at Ephesus. And now he gives them what he believes is some very important truth uh, that he wants them to know, and it's very uh, powerful passage in the Word of God. And that's the context of it here in Acts chapter 20. Now, we want to pick up in Acts chapter 20 in verse 28. And the Bible says here, well, we have verse 27. See, for I have not shunned to declare unto you, say, all the counsel of God. And so Paul says, when I was there for about three years, I, I preached everything I believe that God wanted me to preach and the whole counsel of God. Now, in other words, that refers to the whole counsel of God where he didn't skim, he didn't compromise, he uh, uh, didn't leave out things, but uh, the whole counsel of God. Now, in verse 28, now, actually, beginning in verse 18 through 21, he has to do with the past and then uh, in verses 22 through 27, the present, and now he's dealing with the future, say the future of the church at Ephesus. Now, and um, so in verse uh, 28, he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves. Now, um, and to all the flock. Now, flock, he's talking here about the overseers in the church at Ephesus, and uh, in Ephesus, um, they were meeting in homes at that time, and there were several home churches. They obviously didn't have a building, so where did they meet? They met in the homes of uh, believers, and, and so there were several homes, and uh, in each home, there would have been someone who would have been an overseer of that part uh, of uh, the flock. So he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves, um, and so he's talking here about the leaders. And the first thing he tells them is uh, take heed to yourself. And a great principle there in the Word of God, and that principle in the Word of God is uh, you're never going to be able to help somebody else unless, first of all, you are right with God. So you make sure you're right with God. Make sure you're doing what God wants you to do, because if you don't, you'll never be able to uh, help anybody else. See, he doesn't say here, uh, take heed unto the flock. But you see, as we read the Word of God, that's very instructive. See, and uh, what he says to, to yourself. See, make sure uh, you're doing what God wants you to do, and make sure you're in uh, the will of God. Now, uh, and then he says, and... To all the flock. Now, again, they're meeting these various house churches all over uh, the city of Ephesus, and then unto the flock. See, uh, you are to minister to the flock, and um, now that's your responsibility. But first of all, you minister to yourselves. Now, this is very similar to uh, Acts chapter um, 6, as you turn back to Acts chapter uh, uh, 6, and the Bible um, says here in uh, Acts chapter uh, 6 and verse 4, say, and uh, the leaders of the church at Jerusalem, there in Jerusalem, it says, uh, we will give ourselves continually, say, to prayer 
and then the ministry of the word. See, and what they're talking about here is helping out the uh, poor saints and the widows and so forth that were in the church at Jerusalem. And they said that uh, uh, they appointed men to do that because they, you see, the Bible says, we will give ourselves to prayer, number one, prayer, and number two, to the word of God. And so, see, first of all, we take heed to ourselves. We can never help somebody else unless, first of all, our hearts are right with God. And if we're not right with God, and if we're not built up in the faith, we'll never be able to help anybody else. And then, um, so he says here in verse 28, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now, again, that's the word translated bishop in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's a word that means overseers. And they were the overseers um, uh, of these local churches in the city of Ephesus uh, to feed the church of God. And their responsibility was to feed the church, see, to preach the word of God, to give out the word of God, to help people be built up in the word of God. That's what the church was all about. And um, the Bible says here, the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. That's very interesting, again, and very instructive as we study the word of God. See, it has nothing to do about a pope or a hierarchy uh, and uh, that type of a thing. See, who put the men in charge in relation uh, to these local churches, say it was not man. They were not put there by man, but by the Holy Spirit. And um, as, it says, uh, as it says here, uh, which, uh, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you uh, uh, overseers. Now, always keep in mind, again, we point this out so you might better understand the English Bible. See, the word ghost in the original, obviously, is what word? Is that the word ghost in the original? See, it's the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit. So wherever you read in your Bible a Holy Ghost, I think that has turned off a lot of people uh, to the teaching in the Word of God about the Holy Spirit. See, uh, properly understood, He's the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, G, uh, that's very clear as we study the Word of God, not the Holy Ghost. That, again, uh, can be ambiguous and maybe even turn some people off. But now uh, he says the Holy, um, the, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God. Now, again, see, all of this is very, very uh, edifying in uh, the Word of God. Now, again, what we're studying, this is Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Now, again, this is the background material of the book of Ephesians. Before we get into the book of Ephesians, we're studying now about the background as you find it in the book of Acts. See how the church got established and uh, so forth. Years before he wrote, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. Now, um, and he says here, uh, made you overseers uh, to feed. And then he says, see, the church of God. Now, you see, all of this is tremendous truth in the Word of God. See, the Bible says it's the church of God. See, it's God's church. See, now that's very, very instructive because Paul doesn't say it's my church. Now, Paul founded the church. He went in there and he preached the word of God when they were all worshiping Diana and all these occult things and practices. And he went in there and uh, he preached uh, the gospel and they heard the gospel and they got saved. And, uh, but say Paul never referred to it as his church. Say it's the church of God. See, it's God's church. See, the church is God's institution. That's why it's different than any other, uh, if we want to call it, institution in the world. See, it has nothing to do with the political party. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, or some um, organization that's uh, involved in doing good. See, now all of those are man-made. See, the church is not man-made. 
It is God's church. See, it's a church of God. It originates with God. See, Jesus said, I will build my uh, church. It originates with God. And the Bible says that Jesus is the head of the church. So now what he's talking about, see, this is the church of God. See, you make up the church of God. You are part of uh, the church of God. Now, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, uh, as we were emphasizing recently about the blood of Christ, and even last Sunday, the doctrine of um, reconciliation, see, it's all based on the blood. See, salvation is based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, how was the church purchased? See, how did the church come into uh, existence? And you see what he says in verse 28, which he hath purchased with his own blood. See, that's the basis of uh, the founding of the church in the sense that, that people came to realize that they were sinners and the only way that sinners could be saved and brought into a right relationship with God is on the basis of the cross, the blood of Christ, the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood. And so there's another great verse in the Bible about uh, the blood, the church of God, which he purchased see, with his own blood. Now, again, that's a very strong statement in the word of God. See, it seems like it's referring to here back to God. See, it was God's blood, and that's probably a good um, a definition and a way to define who Jesus Christ was. See, when he shed his blood, he shed his blood. But now the Bible says here it was the blood of God. That's how he purchased the church. So you see, Jesus is God. It's no stretch to say that when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on the cross, it was the blood of God. So um, he says, the church of God, which he, again, see, that goes back to God, hath purchased with his own blood. Now, see, he's warning them now about the future. See, and uh, these are great verses to edify us as the children of God. Now, he says, see, and for I know this, that after my departing shall, gr shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, when we read the word of God and all the epistles, now uh, Romans through Revelation, as well as the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Bible always teaches that the church and God's children will be attacked by false doctrine, and it will be vicious. See what he says here, um, for I know, see, not that it might happen, it will happen, um, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. See, and they're going to enter into the church. See, as we mentioned the other day, preaching about unsaved church uh, uh, church members. See, and they'll come into the church. They'll sound good. Uh, they'll uh, uh, evidently act like a Christian, live like a Christian, but they will come into the churches to spread false doctrine. And see, that's... Uh, that's taught throughout the Word of God. For instance, turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Peter, the book of uh, 2 Peter, chapter 2, and verse 1. Say, 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. Say, and he says in the Old Testament, there were always false prophets in Israel. Now, when you study the Old Testament, there are always false prophets in Israel. There are more false, false prophets than true prophets. And most of the people in Israel, for 900 years, they followed and worshipped Baal and the other pagan gods. But he says now in uh, 2 Peter 2, 1, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Say, among you. Not talking about the outside of the church, but the inside. And you see, in uh, just about every book um, in the New Testament, there is a warning about false teachers inside the church. Not outside the church, but inside the church. See, and um, 
he says uh, here, grievous wolves shall enter in among you. And he says they will come. There will be false teachers in the Garden State Baptist Church. And you got to uh, be careful. You need to, that's why we need to preach the whole counsel of God. And that's why we need to take our stand on the word of God. Say false teachers will come and they will seek to ruin uh, the church. Now, that's exactly what Paul is saying here. There's no question uh, about that. And he says not sparing the flock. In other words, uh, as uh, Jesus uh, talked about this, now he says here there will be grievous um, uh, wolves. In other words, they will be uh, very uh, dangerous and uh, uh, vicious and so forth. But uh, what did Jesus say, or how did Jesus say that wolves look when they come into the flock? In other words, will, uh, will they come into the church and everybody say, that's a, a wolf, let's everybody run away. We know that's a wolf. But see, wolves, Jesus said, in what kind of clothing? Sheep's clothing. See, they act like Christians. You see... Uh, that's how they get inside. Nobody would ever dream that they're not a Christian. They're wolves, but they're in sheep's clothing, you see. And so um, he talks about that uh, very clearly in verse 29. Now, in verse 30, he says, Of your own selves shall men arise. Now he's not talking about people coming from the outside, coming into the church, Wolves in sheep's clothing. And by the way, there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing today. See, when you really analyze it, someone says, well, uh, they're using the Bible. They believe the Bible. But the devil believes the Bible. And you remember when Jesus was tempted, how was Jesus tempted? How was Jesus Christ tempted by the devil? How did the devil seek to get Jesus Christ out of the will of God when he was tempted? See, and he used the Bible, but see, he misquoted the Bible every time. You see, the devil used the Bible, but he misquoted the Bible, and he took the Bible out of context. So, you see, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, they use the Bible, and there's so much false teaching today that doesn't back up uh, or is not backed up by the Word of God. See, it sounds good. They look like they are sheep. But you see, they're sheep in wolves' clothing, and they always use the Bible. Now, as you study about false doctrine in the Bible, see, they always use the Bible. See, and, but they uh, misinterpret the Bible and misuse the Bible. But he says here in verse 30, this is Acts 20 and uh, verse 30, of your own selves. Now, he's not talking about those that come from the outside into the church, but right within the church. He says here, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. In other words, for right from inside the church, people will arise and uh, they'll spread false doctrine. You see, and uh, as he says here, uh, drawing away disciples after themselves, see, and uh, to get a following. But you see, uh, they're not following the Word of God, and they come from within the church. Now, uh, again, see, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, see, from among you, see, from among you, see, and that's why uh, one of the purposes of the pastor of the church is to protect the church, see, because the devil is always seeking to bring false doctrine into the church. That's what the devil does with a, a Bible-believing church. Now you say, well, how do you know that, uh, Pastor? That's what the Bible says here. Now you see, Paul is warning them here. See, he's saying, I'm not going to see you again, so I want to warn you. And again, see, all of this helps us to better understand the book of Ephesians when we get in the book of uh, Ephesians. There, he says, therefore, watch and remember, now he says, be on guard. What? Be on guard for false teaching. Say, teaching that will corrupt the church. 
teaching that will lead people astray. Now, it sounds good and uh, so forth. Uh, just like today, one of the major issues uh, in the church today and in our Christian schools and um, uh, amongst Bible-believing people today is that there's no such thing as repentance. So you just believe in Jesus. That's all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you're saved without any repentance. Now, see, that's heresy. Jesus said repentance and remission of sins. There's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Nobody can be saved unless they repent. They realize they're a sinner and turn from their way to Jesus Christ. See, everybody on the radio, everybody on television, all of our Christian schools, they say you must believe in Jesus. Now, uh, in fact, a lot of our Christian schools, um, uh, they say, uh, you know, that you want to fill out an application to come to our school, they have a box. And um, check this box. Have, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And if you check that box, box you're accepted in the school. See, uh, doesn't ask if you've been converted. You see, it doesn't ask if you're saved and know you're saved, but just if you believe in Jesus. So, see, there's a lot of heresy today in one place or another. See, it's just like uh, people who observe what's going on in Christianity today, um, both in the charismatic, Pentecostal, and so-called evangelical church, everybody who has uh, uh, observed it today, they say that the church today, our Bible-believing churches today, are not involved in preaching the gospel anymore. See, they've been deceived, and now most of our churches are preaching politics rather than the Bible, or they're preaching what people want to hear rather than the Bible. So um, we see there's false teaching every place. So um, he says they're going to come from within and they sound good and may even be leaders in the church. But you see, are they really preaching the word of God? See, are they really preaching the truth of the Bible? Now, they may say a lot of good things. They may, and obviously, false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing are very persuasive or they couldn't get in the church to begin with. And according to Paul, they would not be able to spread their doctrine in the church. See, unless they're very smooth and so forth. So now in verse 31, he says, Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now here, I don't think he's talking about his evangelistic effort in Ephesus but he's talking about his edification effort. So again, they got saved, they lived in houses, and he went to the houses and he taught them. And his whole ministry there was to teach them the word of God face to face in uh, their houses. And he says, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And he was pleading with them to follow the word of God. Don't get involved in false teaching. Don't uh, allow people to lead you uh, astray. And then he says here in verse 32, and now, brethren, I commend you to God. So he says, I'm giving you over to God. I'm praying that God's will would be done in your lives. And he says, and to the word of his grace. Now, uh, there's a great verse in the Bible. Say, it's the word of his grace. Say, the grace of God in the context here probably referring to God's strength, God's ability. See, it's the word that will give you strength and ability to live the Christian life. See, but that's based on the word uh, of God. And then he says here, which is able, see, to build you up. Now, again, as we've said many, many times, how is a person edified? How are you built up in the things of God? See, what's the Bible say? It sets the word of his grace. We're built up through the word of God. See, uh, now, a lot of times you say, well, I need this, I need that, the other thing, and things are brought in the church. But how is a person edified? How is a person edified in the New Testament church? See, through the word of God in the local church. 
And by the way, the interesting thing here, he doesn't add anything else, amen? He doesn't say, well, you have this program or that program or another program. He said it's the Word. See, the thing that will build you up is the Word of God. And as we've said many, many times, say that's the purpose of the church. The church is not a social club. It's not a recreational club. Uh, the purpose of the church is to preach the Word of God. And as we preach the Word of God, we'll be built up. See, we'll become strong in the things of God. And it's impossible for anybody to get strong spiritually apart from the church and the preaching of the Word of God in the local church. That's exactly what he's saying uh, here. You see, and uh, uh, commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up. And then he says something very interesting here that most of the time we gloss over and we don't get a hold of it. And he says here, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Now, the word sanctified means those that are set apart. It's another way of referring to people who are saved. See, many times when the word sanctified is used in the New Testament, it's used as a synonym for being saved and justified and right in the sight of God. Now, of course, it means to be set apart. And see, what's it mean to be set apart? You're set apart because you're saved. But now, you see, he says here, it's able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. You see, and uh, to give you an inheritance. Now, that is a great Bible truth that most of the time is neglected. See, our, in our inheritance. Now, see, now, who's he writing to? He's writing to people who were saved for a short period of time, and he says, you have an inheritance. Now, um, as, he, as he says here, to give you an inheritance, and, that, and you uh, will learn about that inheritance through the word of God. Now, uh, what, what is Paul talking here in relation to this matter of an inheritance? It's that's a neglected subject in the Bible, but it's a powerful subject in the Bible and a very important subject in the Word of God. Now, now, first of all, when we think of an inheritance, it's something that is received from our parents when they die. And that's the way the word is used today. We get an inheritance. They died. They leave the, uh, the, the house or whatever to you. And so you say, people say, well, I got this in my inheritance, you see. And um, that... Uh, an inheritance is something that's received as a gift. Simply, they put that in their will, and you get that as uh, an inheritance, you see. But in the Bible, an inheritance is God's divine gift that he gives to all of his children. See, uh, it's God's divine gift for a believer in the future. See, the Bible, when you read about inheritance in the Bible, it never talks about we get our inheritance down here. Again, see, all of these verses are not dealing with theology and doctrine, but you see how wherever you study the Bible, you go, always get into a lot of doctrine, theology, and Bible uh, 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 teaching. Now, you see, and our inheritance is God's divine gift, you see, that has to do with the future of the Christian. Say, you have an inheritance, I have an inheritance. We don't get our inheritance in this life. Say, that has to do with the future in heaven. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a, uh, one of the most important verses in the Bible on the matter of our Inheritance. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and um, in verse 3, he talks about the resurrection. See, we have a living hope, 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, see, we have a living hope. See, our hope is in the future, and that 
Hope is based on the resurrection of Christ. As he rose from dead, we'll rise from the dead and uh, be with him someday. But you see what the next verse says in uh, after the resurrection, he talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in verse three. He says to an inheritance. Now, uh, you see, Jesus Christ has given us an inheritance. Now here, Peter's saying that's related to the resurrection and the future. See, Jesus rose from the dead, and um, because of that, you have an inheritance as a child of God. Now, you see, he goes on and he says three things about the inheritance. First Peter, two, uh, First Peter 1 and verse 4. And inheritance, number one, it's incorruptible. It can never, ever be destroyed now actually by way of application this is a description of heaven say so it'll never your inheritance will never be destroyed and the guarantee of that is the resurrection of jesus christ now number two he says in verse four uh it is undefiled now in other words there are no defects. Somebody, I think, has well said, your inheritance, my inheritance, is sin-proof. There'll never be any sin in heaven or any defects or sin ever associated with our inheritance in Christ. Now, and then he says the third thing here, that fadeth uh, not away. You see, uh, it's time proof. It's an eternal inheritance according to the word of God. See, an eternal inheritance. Now, uh, then the next part of the verse tells us when you get your inheritance. See, it's a great truth in the Bible. It's very edifying and to build us up in the things of God. Because in 1 Peter 1 and verse 4, he says, it's reserved. Where is it? In heaven for you. See, it's not upon earth. You don't get your inheritance upon earth. See, but you do get your inheritance in heaven, and it's reserved or it's kept in heaven for you. Now, um, that's a great truth as we read the Word of God. See, it's under divine protection. See, your inheritance is under divine um, protection. You see, based on the uh, uh, resurrection of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, this is taught, uh, this teaches the certainty of their inheritance. See, now, Paul's bringing out a great truth here. See, uh, as he says here, to give you an inheritance. See, he says, uh, through the word of God, you are going to learn about your inheritance in heaven see not upon earth now uh that's the the bible teaching some of the bible teaching about our inheritance in jesus christ and as a christian it is not an inheritance that we gain down here you see but it's an inheritance that we will get in heaven now now right away um that helps us to uh, uh, understand the Christian life. And that we we're talking uh, just previously about false doctrine. How many books, churches teach you get your inheritance down here? Say, if you're a good Christian, everything will go right in your life. And God will bring all of his blessings into your life down here upon earth. Say, and that's taught. Say, a very secular thing. Say, but uh, the only thing is, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Say, and all that fits together as you study the Word of God and you study doctrine. Why? Our, we don't get our inheritance down here. Paul didn't get his inheritance down here, he was martyred as well as many of the uh, early uh, uh, Christians. But you see, he says it's reserved, it's guaranteed 
in heaven. Now you see, there's a lot of theology there. See, our inheritance is not upon earth. It is in heaven. And that's a certainty of it. See, it's kept. But what does Peter say? Say, it is kept in heaven for you. It's not upon earth. It's in heaven uh, uh, for you. By the way, that word uh, reserved. You see, he says it's reserved um, in heaven for you. That's a very interesting word that Peter uses. Say, in other words, it's kept right now. It'll be given to you when you get to heaven. You'll get your inheritance in heaven. Now, uh, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. And because uh, the same word is used here and it helps us to understand it. See, in uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, what does that mean? See, they are in a place of torment uh, today, but you see, they will be judged in the future. Now, they're kept in this place today, um, but they're reserved, you see, unto judgment in the future. Now, you look down in verse 9, you have the same word in 2 Peter 2 and verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, you see, you have that word reserved. What does it mean? See, uh, ungodly people are not being punished today in the world today, but they are reserved. See, they're kept unto, as it says there very, very uh, clearly in 2 Peter 2, 9, to reserve, and by, to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. In other words, in the future, they will be judged. Now, in the meantime, they're reserved. It's certain, you see, they will be uh, judged in the future. Now, you see, the Bible says that our inheritance is reserved in heaven. See, it's in heaven today for every child of God. We don't get it until we get uh, uh, to heaven. So, again, this is a great truth in the Bible. A lot of times we overlook it. And he's saying, now you have an inheritance and I'm sure Paul ta taught them about that. See, it's not in this life. You're not going to get, uh, uh, not everything's going to go right with you in this life. See, uh, the inheritance of a Christian is in the life to come. Now, with that in mind, turn over to uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 34. See, and uh, this inheritance thing in the Bible. See, we need to get a hold of it. See, our inheritance is not in, uh, upon this earth. It is in heaven. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 34, the Bible says, For ye had compassion of me in my bonds. Now, that's uh, talking about the a person who wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, most everybody tells us that nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. See, there's all debate about that because nowhere in the book of Hebrews does it tell us who wrote the book. Now, most all the other books in the New Testament, we know who wrote them. Say, uh, uh, Paul, James, John, and they let us know that they've written them. But now, um, he says in Hebrews 10, 34, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds. Now, what does that mean? This person was in jail. This person was in prison. And these Christians that he is writing to, these Hebrew Christians, these Jews who got saved, identified with that person in jail. Maybe they brought them food, uh, whatever. But you see, they had compassion on him. And these saved people, these Christians, even though this person was in jail, evidently for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, they identified with him. Now, um, and as a result of that, in verse 34, it says, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now, that means that, see, because 
they identified with this person who we don't know. Some people say it's Paul, we don't know. See, you, you don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. So if the Bible doesn't tell us uh, who wrote the book, we don't know who it is. So your guess is as good as mine. And that's why I don't like to get into debate about things that the Bible is not specifically on. See, why debate about things like that? Now, he says here, in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now, that means because you, the people he's writing to here, as Christians identified with me, you see, then your, and by the way, the word goods is the word possessions. See, and your possessions were confiscated. See, in other words, uh, bring it up to modern day. Uh, because you identified with the Christian, this Christian man in jail, and his stand for Jesus Christ, uh, they confiscated your bank account. That's it. All your money was gone. They confiscated your property. They confiscated your house. That's what he's talking about here. You see, now, now again, that's why I want to be careful. See, our inheritance is not down here. Doesn't mean everything go right. They lost everything or much of what they had because they identified with this person in prison and the preaching of the gospel. And uh, so he says, uh, and you took joyfully the spoiling, the, the confiscation, the plundering of your goods. In other words, they said, okay, uh, these people here, over here, uh, we know they're Christians, we know they meet together in the local assembly, and so we're gonna make a lot of trouble for them and plunder their goods. Uh, whatever that means. Did they come and burn their houses down? I don't know, but it says they plundered their possessions. See, their goods. But then in verse 34, he says, knowing in yourselves that ye have a better and enduring substance. See, you have in heaven. See, that's the inheritance. See, in not upon earth, in heaven, a better and enduring substance. Now, the word substance is the word possessions, possession. See, it's the same word as goods in this uh, verse. So it's talking about their possessions, but in yourself, uh, taking the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves ye have in heaven a better and enduring possession. That's really a powerful verse in the Bible. What's it saying? See, those Christians knew that our real possessions, our real goods, our real substance is in heaven. And that's, that's quite a verse in the Bible, amen? See, that, that's something to shake every Christian up. See, these things down here, as Jesus said, are passing away, amen? See, our real substance and treasure is in heaven. See, that has to do with our uh, inheritance. And then uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. See, Jesus had a lot to say about this. Over and over again, uh, he talked about it. Like in Luke chapter 12, and he's talking here about uh, the rich, uh, f uh, the fool, uh, the farmer, and uh, uh, so forth. In uh, Luke chapter 12, and we read here in uh, verse 15. See, as he introduces this uh, parable in chapter 12 and verse 15, he says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. That's possessions upon earth. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. God never evaluates anybody by what kind of car they drive, how much money they have, whether they are rich or poor. See, God doesn't evaluate a person. See, he says here, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. Now, people think that. A lot of Christians think that. And they hold on very tightly to their possessions. And I've said many, many times, and when they die, they give it to the dog pound. You see, they, they hold it 
It's not God's. It's not given for the glory of God. Now, again, I'm not against dogs, but I am against people leaving uh, great sums of money to their dogs when they die, you see, rather than using it for the glory of God. Now, um, but so I'm not talking about that, but he says, see, it consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then in verse 16, he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. Then, as you read it and, and so forth. And in verse 20, Jesus said, And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall, soul shall be required of thee. And then in verse 28, he said, He said, um, uh, verse, verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. See, God wants us to be rich towards God. See, and then in verse 20, he said this unto his disciples. Now, see, all of this, what we're talking about, uh, you see, is our inheritance is not in this world. See, it's in the future. It's in heaven. It's reserved. It is uh, certain, you see, and that inheritance has to do with the rewards and the blessings that we will receive in heaven someday. That's the inheritance of the children of God. See, that's your inheritance. See, uh, now again, you get into a lot of Bible doctrine and you get into a lot of uh, Bible teaching as we study the Word of God. You see, in uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, um, uh, there in uh, Acts chapter 20, we go back to our uh, uh, passage, and what does it say? And now, brethren, I commend uh, uh, you unto God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. See, that inheritance is in heaven. You see, your inheritance is in heaven. Uh, indirectly, what's he talking about? You may be persecuted down here. You may have what you have uh, confiscated. You say, oh, that would never happen. Uh, yes, it's happening to Christians today. Uh, you talk about uh, recently in Vietnam, uh, some Christians were exposed in Vietnam today. This is recent news, and the government confiscated all their uh, possessions, and I believe they were put in jail. Say, all of their possessions were confiscated in Vietnam today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, today, because they were Christians. The same is true in China today. If someone is found to be a dedicated Christian uh, serving Jesus Christ in China today, all of your possessions will be confiscated today in China if you really openly take your stand uh, for the Lord. You see, see and uh, verses like this are very meaningful to those people. Why? See, the Bible teaches our inheritance is not in this life. See, our rewards are not in this life. Rewards have to do with the future. Our inheritance, as Peter says, it's reserved, it's kept in heaven for you. When you get to heaven, you will get your inheritance. Now, again, see, we're studying the background of the book of uh, Ephesians. But you see, wherever you study the Bible, you get into a lot of Bible doctrine. Should I live for myself? Should I be selfish? Should I just want to follow Jesus for what I can get out of it? Um, is my Christianity a health and wealth gospel? See, where it's centered down here and the blessings that God can give me down here? Uh, you see, is it an earthly Christianity that I am uh, following? Or it is a Christianity you find in the Bible where Jesus said, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. It doesn't mean that everything will go right. 
You say, uh, you say it's our inheritance is in heaven. And by the way, it's a great verse for eternal security. It's reserved in heaven. See, it's kept, divinely kept in heaven. And when you get to heaven, you will get that inheritance. And um, that's why Jesus said, lay up treasures, not upon earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. See, that, what does that mean? See, you and I can live in such a way that we're going to lay up an abundant inheritance in heaven by the way we live down here. So it's a great uh, truth as we study the Word of God. Now, we don't have time to finish it up, but uh, our homework is Acts chapter 20, verses 33 through uh, 38. And there we'll learn some explosive things about the church, about the Christian life, about the Apostle Paul. Um, some tremendous truths there. And all of this, what he's talking about, see, is the background of the book of Ephesians. See, in the future, what should you expect? See, uh, false teaching is going to come into the church, arise uh, among you, but you need to be built up. The way you're built up is through the word of his grace. See, and now, all this yeah, is that Paul is encouraging and teaching and warning the believers who got saved at the church at Ephesus. Now, as years go by, he's going to write them to them the book of Ephesians. And that's why all of this um, will help us to better understand what Paul does say to the church at Ephesus in the book of Ephesians and what, interestingly enough, he is not going to tell them and he is not going to uh, talk to them uh, about. So uh, our homework is Acts 20, verses 33 through 38.